In October of 2016, Life Church embarked on one of the most meaningful steps forward that we've ever taken in the life of our church. Our leadership team felt led by God to begin a spiritual journey called Elevate. We are one year into this journey in which we're asking God to elevate our love for Him, elevate our faith in Him, and elevate our passion for His kingdom as we become a more generous people. My wife grew up in the church. Um, I didn't. You know, tithing for me was five bucks every couple year, or a couple times a year I went to church. But Elevate really made you dig deeper and search what God wanted you to do for the church and what we could do for not only our generation, but for the generations, you know, coming after us. Our number one goal in Elevate is and always has been 100% engagement. That 100% of us who call Life Church our church would really take a next step in our relationship with God. That all of us would care more and more about forever stuff and less and less about temporary stuff. You know, you come up to Christmas and you come up to birthdays and you come up to, well, do we want to buy, you know, this, that, or the other for the house or do we want to do this upgrade? And in reality, you're looking back at the past few years and you're thinking, if we could just put that off for one more year, we can actually give to something that'll give us back for the next generation. So new hardwood floors or, you know, giving a future to our children and their children's children, it, it was a no-brainer. I've been so amazed by how so very many of us have gone to another place in our spiritual journey, places we may never even have imagined just a few short years ago. Gosh, God just challenged us to step up our commitment and more importantly, our trust in Him. And just to believe that He will provide because the truth is He has always provided for us through everything that we went through. He was always there. And so we, uh, we just made the choice to, to make a, take a bigger step and we have and we haven't looked back and it's just been a great journey and it's really not been, it's been a stretch but it has been a joy, it hasn't been hard. It's been, I've been grateful that we've done what, what we said we would do and that we're able to honor God and all that He's done for us in that way. God has been so very good to us this last year. We're reaching more people with the gospel than ever. Since last fall, we've seen over 70 people baptized. This last Easter, we had over 1,700 people in attendance, our biggest day we've ever had as a church. Right now, there's more people in life groups and more people in small groups studying the Bible than we've ever seen before. I've seen over 200 people have, have begun giving to Life Church for the very first time, just since we've begun this Elevate journey. And hundreds more have radically increased their generosity. A year ago, our secondary goal was that God would provide eight and a half million dollars in total generosity over the 24 months between December 2016 to December 2018. We were grateful to celebrate over $8 million of commitments and expected gifts towards Elevate. A year ago, we believed that eight and a half million would fully resource all that God was calling us to do for the next two years. However, over the last 12 months, due to the incredible increase in construction costs in our area, it has become clear that in order for us to do these things, we really need to receive nine and a half million dollars over this two year period. We recognize that this is a remarkably bold goal. Out of the nine and a half million, about 2.7 million is what is needed to allow us to continue to make a difference in South Reno through our church's ongoing ministry operations. This portion is what you might think of as our general fund. About six million is going to allow us to impact our community more than ever through allowing us to take next steps on our campus through building our gymatorium and office wing. And 950,000 is allowing us to make a bigger difference than we have ever made before outside of South Reno. We've already fully funded our Compassion International project and are in the midst of the ongoing funding of the launch of our Midtown campus, plus our regular and ongoing local and global mission partners. We look forward in 2018 to fund $100,000 in grants to local nonprofits as well. So here we are, approaching the halfway point in our journey, and we want to take a few weeks where we pursue God more than ever before as we continue on in this Elevate journey. We want to grow in our faith. We wanna grow in our love 
and we want to grow in our passion for the kingdom and grow in our generosity. We want this to be a time where each of us are encouraged, nourished, and challenged spiritually. As we do that, I would imagine each one of us falls into one of three different groups of people. First, there are some of us who, who are new to Life Church or new to Elevate, and you have little or no idea about what this Elevate initiative is all about. You joined our LC family sometime after last October, and you wonder, what is this Elevate journey, and how do I become a part of it? You see, from the beginning, Elevate has been for all of us, and we would love for you to jump in with us and make a commitment for the final 12 months of Elevate so that you too can experience the spiritual growth that comes from elevating our investment in what God is doing in our church, in our community, and in our city and beyond. So we weren't here 12 months ago when Elevate kicked off, but we're super excited to uh, jump on board for the last 12 months because we've seen how much impact it's had on other people's lives. And we're excited to have, to reap the same benefits that they have. There are others of you who made an Elevate commitment a year ago. And since then, some hard times have come. Maybe you've stayed strong. Maybe you are continuing to persevere, but it has not been easy. Things have come up that you didn't expect. It's been harder than you thought. You didn't know it would be like this when you made your commitment. And to you, I want to say, be encouraged. Take nourishment from this series and reach out to the God who loves you and who wants to uphold you and strengthen you and the honoring of this commitment that you made. For you, this journey is about you committing to finish strong. And that is exactly what I want to encourage you in as you take comfort in Him. Just over two years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer in my spinal cord near my brainstem. My doctors prior to the operation said that I would probably never walk again. Having cancer can hit you financially. And we, we prayed about that and how it would relate to Elevate. We upped our giving, even though we were going through this hardship. It was a long anticipated journey to get to this point. And now being able to see and, and work at the new kid's life is, is proof that God has a plan for Life Church. This is just a new beginning. There are others of us who made an Elevate commitment who have maybe had an increase in faith or an increase in finances over the past year. It's not that making your Elevate commitment has been easy because it has likely required a lot of sacrifice. I know that's how it's been for Claire and I. But you're sensing that the Lord may be stretching you to take a challenge and to take another elevated step of faith for Him. I want to encourage you to do so. Claire and I last year stepped out and took the biggest step of faith that we have ever taken with our giving. And I will tell you that for us, it has not been easy. But even for us and our three kids, we've been compelled by all that God is doing around here. And we're asking God that if He prompted us to take another step, that if He prompted us to increase our current commitment to another elevated place, that we would certainly do it. To know that we could be part of a campaign, we could be part of an initiative that would challenge us to give more sacrificially and knowing that it's for God's kingdom, we were all in and we jumped on board and it's just been amazing seeing God meet our financial needs and exceed them. He's grown our family just closer, grown my husband and I closer together. And again, it's just amazing to see that only things that God can do, only things that God can be, can be explained by Him, we've seen through this Elevate Challenge. Church, it has been a thrill to take this first 12 months of this journey together, to see God elevate our faith, to see God elevate our love, and to see Him elevate our commitment to the kingdom. And I'm excited about what God is going to do in our hearts over the next year together. As we find ourselves at the halfway point of this Elevate journey, I want us to take the words of the Apostle Paul to heart. He said it this way. He said, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you 
that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Church, I love you so much, and I'm so excited to take this next step together. Let's do this. Let's elevate. Well, hey, I'm excited to be at this midway point of our Elevate journey, excited for these next few weeks. Today, I just want to kind of um, kind of catch us all up so we're on the same page and then kick us off on this series that we're calling The Pursuit. We're going to be looking over the next few weeks at the life of David and, and really what does it mean to be a person after God's own heart. I'm super excited about that. But I just want to recap a little bit just to, to kind of make sure we're all on the same page. That our number one goal for Elevate, as, as we kind of went into this uh, initiative a year ago, our number one goal then and our number one goal now is that 100% of the people that call Life Church their church, from, from the oldest among us down to our kids, our kids are on this Elevate journey with us. From Claire and I, who have been here the longest, to the people that have just made Life Church their church in the last few weeks, from people that have been walking with Jesus for decades, to people newer on following Jesus, to people that have been giving sacrificially for decades, to people that, that really elevate will be the first real time that, that you ever invest in, in God's work financially on the earth, and that it's really that 100% of us would go on a journey with God, that we'd press into Him, that we would ask Him to, to take us to new places of love for Him, new places of faith in Him, and that we'd care more and more and more ab about the kingdom kingdom, that we'd care more about forever stuff and less about temporary stuff, and that the overflow of this work in our hearts would, would be that all of us would take a radical next step in this thing called generosity. And let me show you the passage of scripture we looked at last year. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, this won't be on your screen. It says this. This, was kind of, this is kind of our theme scripture for, for the Elevate journey. It's Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and, and here's what he says. He says, but since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Here's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying that there's no area of the Christian life that's meant to be stagnant, that the Christian journey is a journey of growth, that the moment we give our lives to Jesus, we begin this lifetime journey of becoming more like him. And so Paul says, just like you've taken next steps in faith and in knowledge and in love, just like you've taken all these next steps and all these things that it looks like to follow Jesus, he says, also take a next step, excel or elevate your generosity, go to a new place. See, the thing is, growth in generosity is as natural in the Christian life as growing in prayer, as growing in love. If your Christian life looks the same way it did five years ago, then I, I believe that, 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 that you have fallen into some stagnation, that God's plan is that we would be constantly growing, becoming more and more like Jesus from the moment we begin to follow him until the moment that we're with him in eternity. And so this was always a two-year journey. It was never supposed supposed to be a five or six week thing a year ago, but it was really always intended to be this two years of our life where we say, God, would you take us to a new place? Would you take us to a new place in faith and love and passion for the kingdom? And so our first goal was always that 100% of us would be in this two year journey with God. And then our second goal a year ago was that eight and a half, we'd see eight and a half million dollars in total generosity. That includes kind of our regular giving, what might be kind of your regular offering, plus kind of expanded giving for missions, expanded giving to see our campus build out. And we believed that, that over two years, a year ago, that eight and a half million dollars would fund our general fund, it would fund our work outside of South Reno, our missions, um, it would, and that it would allow us to take next steps in building our campus so that we can build our 1,200 seat worship space and, and gymatorium and our offices and those things so that we wouldn't be in this room forever. People have commented, hey, it feels kind of crowded in this room. And, and the thing of it is, is, people say, hey, I like the people I go to church with. I, I want to sit close, but not that close, you know? And so, uh, and the thing is, we built this room to be a place for kids to play dodgeball. This was never supposed to be a worship space, right? We built this room for, as a place for kids to play dodgeball. That's what it's going to be for, for the long haul. But we, uh, right now we're having service in here, but it was never supposed to be the forever spot. 
And, and so we believed a year ago that eight and a half million dollars would put us in a position to do all the things that, that God had called us to do over this two year period. And what's been crazy is the rise in construction costs over the last year. Uh, uh, and so we've seen the cost on the next phase of our campus go up about 15%, 15% since a year ago. So literally, some of the trades have come in at twice a, a per, the price per square foot as we saw on this building, just because of the crazy construction boom. And so we've seen that price go up. I don't know, you might have seen in the Reno Gazette a few weeks ago, there was an article about the school district. Did you guys see this? That the price on their schools, they got quotes a year ago, that now a year later they're ready to build these middle schools and elementary schools. The price has literally gone up 50% over the last year for them. So I felt better about our 15%. I um, felt like we were getting a deal. And so, uh, and so when, I, uh, when I first uh, got the, you know, the news that, that the, kind of the bids had gone up 15% in a year, I had a few responses. Um, one, it was just a total bummer. Like, man, that's a bummer. Um, and, uh, and second, I kind of had this sense that, you know what, this catches us by surprise. It doesn't catch God by surprise. And, and, and so knowing that, that, that he's always kind of, you know, been in charge, even when we, rec when we recognize it, when we don't. And then the third thing for me is it kind of created a sense of urgency, a recognition of, you know, unless we go into another recession, which no one here is rooting for that, that unless we go into another recession, it'll probably be 15% more a year from now than it is now. 15% more a year later, and that it's kind of this urgency of, of, of the sooner the better. It's only going to keep getting more expensive, and it feels bad to kind of pay more to get the same thing. Doesn't that feel bad? And, and so for me, and so, so we kind of came to a spot where it's like, hey, the reality is we knew when, when, when our goal was $8.5 million a year ago, we knew that was crazy bold. We knew that was a big goal. Uh, I, as I talked to church leaders around the country, they said, hey, that's a big number for a church like yours. And they said, hey, that might be a couple million above what would be normative. In a, and, and, and we just said, you know what, this is what we believe God's called us to do. And, and, and it's when Life Church has never been a church that tried to do the easy thing. When there was about 150 of us and 160 of us, and we began the process of acquiring these uh, 10 acres, it was four different parcels. Two of them had dog kennels on them. One of them had this sweet older lady in the church lived on one of them. The front parcel was owned to be an office building, it was owned commercial. And, and just the process of seeing us being able to acquire, acquire all the four of those. At that point, the property was a little bit over $2 million, and it'd probably be about triple that if we were to buy it today. And at the time, $2 million, it might as well have been $20 million or it might as well have been $200 million. It was just a lot more money than we had. And, and to see kind of God come through in that, we, Life Church has always been a church that's believed God for big things. And so we knew the $8.5 million goal was super big. And so then when it became clear a few weeks ago that for us to do the same stuff we thought we could do for 8.5, it's really closer to 9.5 now, that was kind of a bummer. I thought, well, how am I going to tell people that? Are they going to throw things at me? You know, <laughs> that's why your bags were searched when you came in today. And so, uh, um, and, and, but, it, you know, and so we just said, you know, we knew eight and a half was bold and nine and a half is, is even bolder. And, and so we're just, gonna, we're just kind of calling it the way it is. This is the thing. And, you know, we're just kind of trusting God and just going to kind of see what happens. But knowing that, that, that God has always done um, bigger that, than would be what we could explain and understand. And so that's kind of our two big goals. One is 100% of us on this journey with God, asking him to do something fresh in our lives. And then secondly, that over the two-year period, we'd see $9.5 million in total generosity. So let me um, share with you a couple of things. On November the 12th, uh, we're going to have what we're... Can you pass me that little book? Um, on November the 12th, we're having our Commitment Sunday. You should have gotten a book like this when you came in today. And, and so do me a favor. Don't read the book while I'm preaching, okay? If you guys are all looking down, it makes me super paranoid. And I try to convince myself you're praying for me, but I know that 99% of you aren't that spiritual. And, uh, and so... Um, and, and, then, uh, and then you also should have gotten a commitment card. And so on November the 12th, uh, we're going to all make a commitment. And, and so there's really three types. Um, one is, some of you weren't here a year ago when we kicked this off. And so on November the 12th, we're going to invite you to, uh, to join in on this Elevate journey for the final 12 months. Our goal's been 100%, still is 100%. We're going to invite you to join in for the final 12 months of the Elevate journey. And then for those of us that have already made commitments, um, we're going to ask you to make one of two commitments on November the 12th. One would be to commit to finish strong for these final 12 months. 
and, and, then, uh, and then others, uh, and that'll be many of us. And, and, and then many of us, maybe God has taken you to a fresh place, either in faith or in finances, and, and that you're at a spot to even increase your commitment from a year ago. And so all of us on November the 12th will make um, one of those three commitments. It'll be an epic day. Mark your calendar. And so I want to encourage you to do everything you can to be here in these weeks and to fully engage. And so let's jump in to looking at the life of David. If you have your Bibles, go over to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel 16. Um, why are we looking at David? I think the thing that sets, David wasn't a perfect guy by any stretch, but the thing that sets David apart was, was was he was a man after God's own heart. And I'll talk to you in a minute about what that means. We see a ton about David in the scripture. Um, we see more about David than any other character in all the Old Testament. In the, in the Old Testament, there's 14 chapters about Abraham, 13 about Joseph, 11 about Jacob, 40 about Moses, but there's 66 chapters in the Old Testament about King David. And then we see in the New Testament, we see 57 references to David. And so we know that, that, that David was a shepherd. He was a giant killer. He was a warrior. He was a king. He was a poet. He wrote a ton of Bible. He was an ancestor of Jesus. Jesus was called the son of David. And, and, and so we're going to press him. But what I think is cool about David, why do I think he's called the man after God's own heart? Is that what we see in David is when David was right with God, which wasn't all the time. But when David was right with God, he pursued God, maybe as much as anyone that we see in all of the scripture, just as the things that we see come out of his mouth. In Psalm 42, David said, as the deer pants for the water. Have you ever taken your dog on a long walk? I don't know if you have a dog that's out of shape. Usually your dog's in about as good a shape as you are. And, and so, uh, but you take your dog on a long walk and you take it, you get home and the dog just is panting and all the dog wants to do is drink some water. You ever had that experience? David said, just like an animal that's just so thirsty, where all they can think about is getting a drink, he said, as the deer pants for the water, that's how I long for you, God. What we see is David pursued God. He was hungry for God. Psalm 84, David said it this way. He said, my soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. What David's saying is he said, man, there's nothing I want to do more than be in God's house with God's people and worship him. He just says, I want to know God. I want to experience him. David pursued. That's why we're calling this the pursuit. That the difference in David's life was this hunger and pursuit of God. In that same, in that same chapter, Psalm 84, David said it this way. He said, better is one day in your courts. Uh, better is one day. You thought Chris Tomlin wrote that song. David wrote that song. Uh, he said, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. He said, man, more than anything else, I just want to be where God is. I just want to experience him. David, when he was right with God, pursued God, maybe more than anybody else that we see in scripture. And I think that's why he was a man called a man after God's own heart. Let me show you. First Samuel chapter 16, verse one. And so that's really kind of our heart and prayer for these weeks, is that over these weeks, that, that we would pursue God and, and, and that we'd press into him like maybe never before. 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, here it is. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? So that they, uh, Israel had their first king, Saul. And then he had strayed from God and God said, you're not going to continue to be the king and your kid won't be king, it's going to be somebody else. He said, I've rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. The key word I want you to see there is the word chosen. He said, I have chosen one of his sons to be king. God chose to do something amazing in and through David. And so God does this epic work in David where he takes him from being a shepherd from, and, and then he ends up being this epic warrior. He kills the giant. He, he says David had killed the 10,000s. He was the greatest warrior in Israel's history. He ends up being the greatest king in their history, this ancestor of, of the Messiah, ancestor of Jesus, that, that God chose to do something amazing in him and through him. And I believe that, 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 that God might want to do some amazing things in your life. And that God might want to do some amazing things through you. Really, since, the, since 12 years ago, and Claire and I moved here to, to get ready to start Life Church, well, through this whole 12 years, we've always had this sense that, that God might want to do something special in this church and through this church. 
uh, when we were initially being you know, told about Reno, uh, we, we were originally told 12 years ago that at that time, uh, that Reno and, and our Washoe County was the most unchurched county in, uh, in North America. And so, and that was really part of, of what God used to kind of get our attention to, we were we pastoring a church in Colorado that we planted that was just going incredible, no reason to move, our family was nearby, our best friends were there, but, but God just, when we found out that Reno was at that point, that, that there were fewer people who, who claimed to be in a, in a Bible preaching church at that time than any other county in America, we said, what if God were to do something unique and special in a place where you don't normally expect it. The thing is, people don't move to Nevada to grow spiritually. Did you know that's the truth? No one's ever like, gosh, I'm going to go on this religious retreat. And that's good. It's, uh, you know, it's not what people usually think of. And at that point, when uh, Washoe County was listed as the most unchurched county in America, I, I saw a stat this year that we've actually gone up two notches. Now we're at a number three, which is still pretty terrible. And so, uh, and so God began to kind of put a vision in our hearts of what if God would do something incredible in a place you wouldn't expect it. And then when we kind of began the journey to begin acquiring this property and the vision for the campus here, we began to th you know, see that this is the fastest growing part of our city, the South Meadows Corridor. They're building houses as fast as they can, which is, which is why the construction's costing so much. Dang it. And so... Uh, that they're building houses as fast as they can, and, and that when we ended up right next to the biggest high school in Reno, 2,000 kids right there in the fastest growing part of our city. And, and then the reality is from South Meadows Parkway all the way over to Geiger Grade, so where South Meadows goes all the way to Geiger, you got Double Diamond, you got Damani Ranch, you got Curdy Ranch, they're building houses as fast as they can. In that area, the fastest growing part of our city, there are two religious groups with a plan to have a, a long-term presence here, to have their own campus, a location. One is the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, and, and the other is us. That at this point in time, there's only one church that said, hey, for the long term, we're going to have a location, a, a presence in the fastest growing part of one of the most unchurched cities in America. I've just always believed with all of those things being true, that maybe, just maybe, God might be choosing us to do something unique and special, just like he chose to do something incredible in and through David. Let's keep reading. Look at 1 Samuel 16 and look at me show you verse 6. So they get, so, so Samuel arrives there. He says to Jesse, he said, let's gather all your sons. Let's have a little church service. We're going to consecrate ourselves to God. Get, get all your sons together. And, and, and so verse 6, Samuel knows it's going to be one of these sons. And he says, uh, when they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature. Now, in this culture, oldest son had all of the expectations and, and all the responsibilities and, and all of the privilege. He would get the bulk of dad's money. And if anything ever good came out of the family, it was going to probably be from the oldest son. And so the oldest son comes out first. He's good and tall. He's good looking. Samuel thinks, man, the last king was tall and good looking. It's got to be this guy. And God says, no, that's not the guy. He says, and this is a great little, little verse here, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. Now the second oldest comes. And, and, and so the second oldest son would think, man, if the oldest son dies, I get dad's money. I get the responsibilities. There was some responsibility on the second son. And then God says, neither the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? Did any of you guys grow up in a family where there was enough kids where your parents regularly forgot one of you guys? That happened for some of you? Well, that's what's happening here. Samuel arrives and, and says to Jesse, hey, gather your sons. We have a little church service. We're going to dedicate ourselves to God. So Samuel gathers, I mean, so Jesse gathers the oldest seven. He says, hi, they're all here. And then Samuel says, man, it's none of these guys. Is it somebody else? He goes, oh, yeah, the other one. <laughs> any of you guys, the other one? Is any of you guys? And, uh, but you tell your kids that none of them are the other one, you know? And so, um, 
And then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains the youngest. But behold, he's keeping the sheep. He had the job nobody wanted. He was the youngest. He was out being a shepherd. Nobody wanted the job. You were alone. It was lonely. It was dangerous. Nobody wanted that job. And so there he says, oh, there is the other one. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Here's the second thing. God did more in David's life than he or anyone else expected. David was the youngest. He was almost forgotten. When Samuel said, get all the sons, and Jesse said, all right, they're all here. Well, David wasn't there. He'd been forgotten. He was not one that most people expected much of. No one thought much of the youngest son. No one thought a whole, whole lot of him. He was the shepherd. He was the one out doing the chores nobody wanted to do. He was the low man on the totem pole. But, but God said, you know what? No one else has expected much of him. His dad hasn't even expected much of him. His brothers didn't expect much of him. And maybe even David didn't even expect much of him. But God said, I see things a little bit differently. I'm going to do more in David's life, more in him and through him than, him or, than he or anybody else expected. I'm going to exceed the expectations there. God says, I don't see it the way everybody else sees it. Everybody else has written off this guy. Everybody else doesn't expect much. Everybody else has almost forgotten him, but God says this. He says, I see it differently. I'm going to do something big in him and through him that's going to blow everybody away. It's even going to blow him away. God says, I'm going to do something big. And I, I wonder for us, and I, I wonder, what if we as a church upped our level of expectation? about what God might want to do in, in this church over the next 50 years, about what God might want to do in this church over the next year, about even what God might want to do in this church over the next five or six weeks. And then I wonder even in your personal life, and what if you upped your expectation of what God might want to do in your life over the next 50 years and over the next 12 months and over the next five or six weeks. Maybe you're one of them. Maybe you say, you know what? I feel kind of like David. Maybe most of your life you felt kind of underestimated. Maybe growing up, maybe you felt like maybe your parents didn't expect much out of you. Or maybe your school teachers didn't expect much out of you. Maybe your boss, maybe you feel like he doesn't even appreciate what you do, that he doesn't expect much out of you. And maybe you've begun to believe it, to believe the lie that there's not much in store. But I wonder, what if in this moment we upped our expectancy of what God might want to do in and through this church for the next 50 years, the next 12 months, the next five weeks? And then what if we upped our sense of expectancy about what God might want to do in our own hearts, do in us and through us over the next 50 years, over the next 12 months, and over these next five or six weeks? What if we upped our level of expectancy? What if God did more in your life than you expect? Don't short sell what God might want to do in you in this season. And don't short sell what God might want to do through you in this season. Look over, 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. Here's the third thing. God's spirit empowered David for what he was about to do. Let me show this to you. 1 Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. I love this next little phrase. He said, and the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. You know, here's the thing. God knew that for David to do the stuff he was about to do, that there's no way he could do it alone. God knew it was just going to be a number of weeks before David was fighting a giant. God knew it was just going to be a number, of, a short time after that, but before he ends up being this warrior killing 10,000s of people. It's just going to be a short time after that, that before he ends up being a king, and then he's going to write all this Bible, and he's going to be an ancestor of, of, of Jesus, that all this stuff, and that God knew that, hey, there's no way that shepherd boy is going to be able to do this alone. And it says, so the Spirit of God in that moment rushed onto David, and he was never the same. And I just wonder that if too often we try to do this Christian life just doing stuff that, that we can do, 
that, that in our own strength we can do it. And, and, and here's the thing. If you're a Christian life, if it's something that you can just do your own, then, then you're doing it the wrong way. And, and, and if God's never stretching you and calling you to things that, that are risky and that you're not sure how it's going to work out, where it's going to take some faith and it's going to take him coming through, if that never happens, then, then, then you're doing it wrong because this Christian life is really meant to be lived where it's his spirit in us producing the character of Jesus in our life. And, and, and so it's, it's not meant to just be us. And so we see here that, that God's spirit empowered Davis, David for what he was about to do. And, and, and I really believe for, for us to have experienced all that God wants to do in us and through us, where, where God would take us to new levels of faith and new levels of passion for his kingdom and new levels of radical generosity, that the only way that happens is the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And so God's spirit empowered David for what? He was about to do. Let me share with you three quick things. One, I want to challenge you to fully engage this moment over these next few weeks. I want to challenge you to fully engage. I want to challenge you to do everything in your power to not miss a, a Sunday morning uh, service here at Life Church. And if you do, if you're if you got to work, if you're providentially hindered, then listen at LifeChurchReno.com. But I want to challenge you: do everything in you can in your power to be here these next few weeks. And I want to challenge you to, to be in your, at your life group these next few weeks. I, I want to encourage you to do it. And, and if you're not yet in a life group, you can go out to the table out there. Maria can help you find a life group. Got tons of great groups. I, 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 quick side note, this isn't a part of full engagement, but I've forgotten to say it twice today. And so, uh, hey, if you don't have one of these Elevate t-shirts, uh, you can grab one as you leave. They're free. And, and so grab one of the Elevate t-shirts. If you don't have one, grab one. I've first two services, I didn't announce it. And so if you, if you do have one, but maybe it's shrunk, I guess you can grab theirs. And so, uh, um, it's a grab and elevate t-shirt, but I want to challenge you fully engage, be here on Sundays, press into your life groups, and then pray, ask God to do something fresh in your life in this season. The kind of thing that would only happen by him working in your life. Ask God to do something fresh. Ask him to change your heart. Take you to another spot of faith and love, passion for his kingdom, where you care more about forever stuff, less about temporary stuff. Ask God to do something big in your life. Press into him. And so I want to challenge you to engage it. Engage it fully. Some of you, a year ago, God did something great in your life in this Elevate moment. It's been awesome just talking to people, saying, people saying uh, about just how God's taken them to new places, not just in generosity, but in their marriage and in service, and just in their overall Christian life, how God has really done. But the last year has really been a remarkable year of spiritual growth. And it would be easy for some of us here a year ago to say, hey, God did something cool then. And now I'm just going to kind of coast and I'm all good and I don't need to fully press in and engage it. I believe if that's your attitude, you're going to miss out. And so I want to challenge you to fully engage it. The second thing is I want to challenge you to up your heart of expectancy. Expect God to do something fresh in your life in this season. And third, ask God to do something big. Just say, God, would you do something big in my life through your spirit? Let me pray for you. So, Father, Lord, in this uh, moment, Lord, I pray that you would up our heart of expectancy. God, that you would create in us a heart of expectancy that you're going to do something fresh in our lives. And Lord, we just invite your Holy Spirit, maybe just where you are, just invite the Holy Spirit just to do something fresh in your life. Father, we pray that you'd do something big in our lives. God, that you would take us to a new place with you. Lord, that we would discover what it is to be a man or a woman after your own heart, that we'd pursue you at more than we ever have before. And God, that you would change the way we look at life. God, that we care more and more and more about your kingdom and less about ours, that we care more and more and more about eternity and not about stuff that just comes and goes. So God, we just invite you to do something fresh in our lives, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.